Good morning. Thank you, Mark and Sandra. I'm Shashi Dambishan, uh, Director of Intrans. I just wanted to say, point out a few things, say a few comments, and then uh, give you some things about the program today. Uh, first of all, welcome on behalf of uh, Iowa State University and the Institute for Transportation, we are now known as Intrans, <laughs> formerly known as CTRI. And we appreciate all of you making the time, giving up uh, a lot of your time to be here with us to address this important topic, as Mark just said, uh, to address ways in which we can enhance safety on roadways, looking at it from a human factors perspective, and what might be research opportunities and challenges, and how might we go about addressing them. That's the ultimate outcome that we're looking for at the end of the day today. Dan is the director of the Human Factors and Vehicle Safety uh, Research Program at the University of Iowa. He has worked on a number of projects related to human factors and safety, with a particular emphasis on teen drivers, their behaviors, and safety. Among these are uh, some pool fund projects that involve several states, and one of the more uh, recent projects is on uh, uh, drivers who are 14 or 15 years of age uh, who operate motor vehicles. So without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming Dan. Thank you so much, Dan, for... So what I'm going to talk about uh, today is some of our teen driving work, which I think is very relevant to what we're going to be talking about today. Teen driving is really uh, a pretty phenomenal area to study. We've had some pretty interesting results. It's not often that researchers actually get to put cameras and microphones into cars of teenagers to really understand what makes them tick, how they develop their skills or not uh, when they drive. And one of the things that's really interesting about this phenomenon, about how many kids are killed every year in the U.S., about 5,000 kids are killed uh, driving in cars and around cars. That's, it's the most dangerous thing that we allow our kids to do, uh, but somehow it sort of falls below the radar in terms of really understanding what those dangers are all about. And I think what's very frustrating for us that study this kind of these kind of, this population is that every crash that we uh, do a case study on, every crash that we review in our own uh, video files, you see causes. And they are not accidents by any means at all. And one of the things I'd like you to erase from your memory banks is the term accidents uh, in, any ca in, in any case. There are crashes and all of these have causes. And I think your job today is to try to get at reducing those causes of those crashes. If we can just eliminate one or two of those factors, we can prevent that crash altogether. In terms of what teen crash causes are about, uh, they have a big, big, uh, big trouble in terms of uh, inexperience with vehicle control. And they don't get a lot of practice. By the time uh, they hit the roads, they sometimes only have 10 or 20 hours of driving experience. Uh, some parents don't really have time to spend with them, they rely on driver training uh, to get that time behind the wheel. And then once out there, they have a, a poor ability to anticipate and ident identify hazards out in the field. And then they're very vulnerable to peer influence and uh, are willing to take risks in situations that many of us would never do. And then this is really exacerbated by uh, a poor understanding of their own abilities relative to the task and demands. And I think what's very unique about this generation is that they have much more information that's being thrown at them now than we did a generation ago in learning how to drive when we were as equally as deadly. But now we have cell phones and texting in particular, uh, social communication networks that are constantly being updated and read while they're driving, iPods uh, and so forth very much pervasive. And I think exposure is a critical element for you all to think about today as you go through your focus groups. Uh, Nielsen just released a report last month that showed that the average 16-year-old has 2,800 text message and cell phone interactions per month. Uh, that is unbelievable. So one of the things that we also face is a changing driving environment. Uh, in rural states like Iowa, we've consolidated many schools. Uh, 30 years ago, we had a number of uh, schools spread out in a county. Now we consolidate into one feeder school, which means more driving and more exposure. Again, more exposure to 
high-speed roadways, more ex exposure to gravel, gravel roads getting to school. And uh, the study we did at Clear Creek Amana High School two years ago in Tiffin, Iowa, which is a rural school, the average daily drive uh, of each of our drivers was 40 miles a day. Uh, so stunning exposure uh, out there. Among the urban and suburban drivers, the complexity of the intra-city freeway networks in terms of merging on, merging off, uh, very complex, uh, quick action required type driving uh, is out there, and that's very different. Uh, and again, a generation ago, we had you know, one major freeway coming through town, a few major entrants and exits, and uh, largely uh, suburban driving was done on lower class streets. And again, texting and cell phone communication uh, is very much alive uh, in that context. So if you imagine a, a, a teenager is sending 100 text messages a day, sending and receiving 100 messages a day, the amount of time out of class time they have is relegated really to the time they are in the car. So it's uh, pretty intense. So some of the research, too, that we're looking at uh, that's quite compelling is that we see that the more passengers on board a car, the high, higher probability of a crash. If you get five or six kids in a car, you have an, uh, uh, an enormous uh, confluence of, of issues that are going to come together and likely result in some kind of incident or crash. Most crashes occur before midnight, between 9 and midnight. That's when most kids are out on the road. While we see a lot of fatalities after midnight, most crashes are occurring between 9 and midnight. And the first six months is clearly the most dangerous among this population. But the good news is that, is that enhanced graduated driver's licensing programs uh, are showing very positive results. North Carolina, uh, last year Kansas just enhanced theirs in, in a, a very nice program. And we hope this year we will be able to enhance Iowa's uh, GDL system. And, and we're ready this time. We have lots more data uh, under our arms that we're going to march into uh, Des Moines and present that I think will be even more compelling than the last time we were able to go and visit. So one thing I want to kind of share with you briefly here today is one technology that we think uh, is part of the answer. Uh, and one of the things that we want to do is mentor kids, have parents be able to mentor their kids after they began independent licensing. There are a number of monitoring technologies out there, GPS tracking systems, GPS fences, uh, thing, systems that will uh, let you know where your, your, your child is at any moment of the day, how fast they're going all those things. But we want to concentrate on technologies that help them learn how to drive better. And one of those uh, technologies is called event triggered video. Because in our role, at, and frequently at, at the university, we're placed in sort of the chain of product design. And we know that successful design uh, requires high user acceptance. So on the front end of these kinds of projects, we want to make sure but that's something that, that's not going to hold up implementation later on. Uh, and in this case, uh, the intervention itself is more in, in important than the technology. So, and then finally, we want to really enhance learning for the long term. So event-triggered video gives us an additional element of context of when a safety error occurs. And this is really important. If you have a black box, there is no context. And uh, so, we know that uh, teenagers are pretty good at self-rationalizing. They tell their parents, well, gee, everybody does that. I had to go 80 miles an hour because that's how fast the traffic was going. Uh, they can come up with uh, all sorts of things. But we can provide teachable moments, and what we call sort of the good, the bad, and you almost died. Now, there are several different uh, uh, video rent recorders out there uh, made by Smart Drive, DriveCam. Envision Cam, we've been working with DriveCam for several years and have developed a pretty good partnership. Uh, they essentially, uh, these type of systems record in your car, they're on, I should say not record, they're on 24 hours a day, even while they're sitting in your garage, but they don't record until you have an exceedance, and that is an abrupt braking or steering event that occurs. Then it goes back in time, much like you, you can with your TiVo or digital video recorder and take a look at what actually caused that event. The, the, the driver then gets a blinking light that says the system has recorded an event and then that light will usually stay red until it's downloaded. 
Now, uh, one of the, the next generation systems that we're using is a cellular download, whereas before we were using wireless systems in the parking lots of, of high schools. And uh, now we are also able to capture exact location, lat long, and speed uh, during the event. And this is quite exciting, and I'm not sure how well this is going to show up, but uh, what essentially we see is the, a view inside the vehicle, what you see there on the left. Uh, you can see our drivers here, perhaps not from the back of the room, are not wearing their safety belts. We can see the road ahead, and uh, we can then plot the actual acceleration of the vehicle. That's what you see, the red and, and blue. Uh, then we can provide a narrative of what caused the event. And then what you see here, <coughs> we actually know the exact speed uh, across the 12-second uh, event. We get 12 seconds of video. Uh, eight seconds before and four seconds after the triggering event. And we have the latitude and longitude of that as well. And so adding additional context, we actually now can place this uh, as automatically as presented the exact location of that trigger. And those of you that are roadway designers, this really becomes uh, a really interesting context of where <laughs> errors occur. So if this one young woman is about to take uh, a sharp curve to the left and is going too fast, uh, we can go back and take a look at what the roadway markings are about, what the shoulders are about. There's a lot of really interesting contextual information that's added, added to this. Uh, to give you an example of what uh, <coughs> some of these events look like, some of these are quite graphic, but they're also very instructive. So what we see in uh, these data is that we put uh, these systems in the car uh, for about a year in our previous studies. For the first uh, six or eight weeks or so, they drive without any feedback at all. They don't get a blinking light or anything. We just take a look at characterizing their driving. And after that six or eight week period, we turn on the feedback, and that is the form of the blinking light when it triggers, and we send home a weekly report card that shows how many events they triggered relative to their peer group. So immediately the parent and the teen can see where they fit among their teens. We also show how often they had their safety belt on during these events, uh, as well as passenger safety belt uh, as well. Now the next study that we're doing is called the Million Mile Study, which is a group of 14-year-old drivers, 14 and a half-year-old drivers, school permit uh, operators here in Iowa. Uh, we have the first control condition uh, that we've ever done, and that means that uh, one group will have the system and get the feedback every week, and the other group gets no feedback at all during the entire project. So we can really take a look at maturation effects over the course of the, the six months that they're in the car. And then we're also looking at a group, uh, another cohort of 16-year-olds, newly, newly, newly licensed 16-year-olds that are both have not had the school permit and ones that have had that school permit as well. So we'll have 90 uh, drivers in that in that design, again split by a uh, control group. <clears throat> so right now we have 10 systems installed. Uh, we're in, we're installing 10 more in November and December. Uh, we're very much uh, in the data processing and coding and, and starting our weekly reports for that project. Uh, we're also uh, looking for funding actually as we speak to look at doing what we want to call the 100 crash study uh, we have 50 crashes right now that we've been able to obtain to really take care, take, take a very detailed look at what all the different crash causes are uh, among the videos, uh, some of those that I shared here earlier. Uh, we'd like to uh, develop an interdisciplinary team uh, to code these from traumatology folks to roadway engineers, uh, traffic engineers, try to really put together a comprehensive team because every specialty looks at these videos and they see something different. One of the things that uh, we do in, in teaching human factors engineering that's always a great challenge, and you've, you've no doubt come across many products that you just cannot figure out how they were ever designed. And so we have a saying in human factors, and that is, know thy user, and you are not thy user. 
And uh, what that is essentially is try to understand why people, how other people operate, not yourselves, and I'm not saying you in particular, but this is a, uh, an important thing to think about uh, as you think about other ideas. Because uh, I think we're really blessed with a, a group of very smart, innovative people today, and uh, we're going to be able to come up with some interesting outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you.